Today, uh, we have with us uh, Andrea Paris from the Political Science Department, and, and she'll be speaking to us on missions and development, uh, Christian NGOs and the Canadian development sector, and I look very much forward to hearing her work on this topic, having read her article in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies on this theme. Okay, so thanks, Andrea. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming out on a Friday afternoon at a busy time of the semester. Um, can you hear me all right? Is the microphone turned on? Yeah, okay, great, okay. So just to frame my talk and tell you how I've come at this, um, this, this picture kind of gives you a sense of the kinds of questions I'm asking in my research on how religious organizations go about delivering humanitarian and development assistance and this is, this is kind of emblematic of my talk. Here we have uh, one of the, the largest Canadian uh, development organizations, that, which is actually a coalition of multiple Christian um, organizations uh, that, that is actually the second largest recipient of, C of CETA funding. Um, overall between religious and secular organizations, uh, delivering what they say is a Christian response to hunger. So what does this actually mean to have a response to hunger that is a Christian response to hunger? And how is this different from other possible ways that we could think about responding to hunger? So I came to this research um, I, I, I specifically focus my research uh, on the humanitarian sector and have gradually dr drifted over into looking at development more broadly. Um, and so I, I started doing some research looking at CETA's funding practices towards Canadian faith-based organizations. And that's the article that Adam just mentioned. Um, so I, I kind of dug around and look at the history, looked at the history of CETA's engagement with faith-based organizations and kind of its policies of, its current policies of non-engagement, right? Which is really interesting in the broader context of development studies where religion is starting to be, well, has become the kind of hot topic in development studies, right? So CETA, CETA has kind of uh, opted not to engage in that, whereas within uh, the academic field of de development studies, as well as in the broader kind of world of practice, people are starting to think about this, right? So my previous work, I started off with that project looking at the CETA end of things, and the logical next step for this research was to look at what uh, faith-based organizations are doing themselves. Right? So this is kind of the other side of the coin and the research that I'm going to present to you today. So to get into this kind of first look at uh, Christian organizations in Canada, I'm going to frame this um, by telling you about two events. And while well, one of them is an, an event and the other one is a piece of recent research. So earlier this year, uh, you might have read in the headlines a pretty controversial story. This came out in February 2013. Um, Canadian news outlets reported that Crossroads Christian Communications, which is an or evangelical organization um, doing a lot of broadcasting and educational work, had received a half a million dollars in funding for overseas relief and development projects from CETA. Um, and then it also had come out that the same organization had posted um, this argument that hom homosexuality is a sin and a perversion on its website. So further aggravating the situation, the seed of funding had been given to Crossroads to support the building of wells and latrines in Uganda, a state that is on the verge of passing anti-homosexuality legislation. So Crossroads responded to the initial press inquiry about its website content by removing the post and stating that the CETA funding was only used for specific development objectives that did not include evangelical work. Um, and in a later press release, the organization said that actually the material was an, in an archived link that, sh that they didn't even realize was still accessible. It should have been removed long ago. Uh, but the damage had already been done. Um, rights groups immediately denounced Crossroads activities in Uganda, as well as CETA for providing funding to the organization.
The criticisms went further to argue that taxpayers' money should not be used to finance religious groups working abroad, that it is, quote, dangerous for governments to give financial support to religious development organizations. And eventually, Julian Fantino, who is the Minister of International Cooperation, kind of half-heartedly attempted to defend the agency's funding of Crossroads by insisting that funding decisions are made on the basis of the merit of the proposals, but he also decided that Crossroads would go under review before further payments would be made. So that's the, that's the event. Um, the piece of research from the kind of the academic research side of things is a piece of research that was published in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies just this past summer in a special issue on religion and development. And so uh, this is a piece by Francois O'Day and a couple of other co-authors um, who analyzed CETA's funding practices over the decade of 2000 to 2010. And he concluded that between the period of 2001 to 2005, funding to secular organizations, uh, so the secular organizations are in the red, had gone up 21%. Uh, and then in the second half of the decade, funding to secular organizations had just increased by 5%. Whereas if we look at the funding to religious organizations in Canada, um, from 2001 to 2005, it had decreased by 4.6%. But in the next five years, there was a dramatic increase of 42% increase in funding. And then he goes on to point out that, um, interestingly, this coincides with the change in government. Right? So the first half of the decade was a liberal government. The second half of the, the decade is a conservative government. Right? So this, this has some kind of, um, this might indicate that uh, Canadian Overseas development assistance has been increasingly politicized under the, um, under the rule of, of Stephen Harper. And he kind of argues even further um, that this indicates a move towards the confessionalization of Canadian foreign aid in contrast to a process of secularization that occurred in the 80s and 90s. So I've told you about this event that hit the, 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 the public media. I've told you about this piece of research that um, has this real sense of warning, right? There's kind of a sense of foreboding about this and that he says we're, there's a danger that we're returning to a previous missionary era, right? So there's a lot of negativity here. Um, so in all of these discussions about CETA's relationship with NGOs, there's a, there's a presupposition here um, that Christian organizations, including the ones that engage in proselytistic activities, are, are static, right? Missionary organizations are missionary organizations, um, and there's no kind of sense of variety or looking at what kinds of organizations make up this sector. Um, there's also little recognition or acknowledgement of how these organizations might have engaged in their own processes of learning and adaptation to the development sector. And so my research is intended to kind of address this gap by examining how Canadian Christian charities can be viewed as sites of contestation about the boundaries between what can be considered development and what can be considered missionary work or missions. So missionary organizations have been largely regarded um, in development research and, and by practitioners as pretty marginal actors um, because of their participation in evan evangelism and Bible teaching and their often conservative uh, political and social stances. They're regarded by suspicion by donor agencies, secular NGOs, and more liberal faith-based organizations. But these same missionary organizations remain primary service providers in many development settings. And I'm reminded just as, a, as an, an example um, from my own experience spending a year in Bangladesh a couple of years ago, I went to visit a hospital in the south of ba Bangladesh, not far from Cox's Bazaar. And this hospital was run by the Baptists and had been there since at least the late 50s, early 60s. Um, for many decades, it was the only health service provider available in the region for that, that served hundreds and thousands of people, if not millions, right? And it's only in recent years that the Bangladesh government has set up a state hospital to kind of help them out, right? So 
and, and these, these missionaries kind of stayed there through the Civil War, the 1971 Civil War, which is a brutal kind of experience, right? So this is just an example that gives a sense of how kind of important these actors can be in development settings. The other side of this is that these organizations are making complex political decisions about uh, wh how to seek funding and where to allocate their resources. And these, diff these choices have become more difficult as organizations have, been, uh, has, have experienced increasing pressure to NGOize, right? To become more like NGOs. So these are the main questions that have um, informed my research. How do Christian organizations contribute to the Canadian development sector? How do cr Canadian Christian organizations view this distinction between missions and development? So there's a number of reasons why I think that this sector merits further analysis. So I've already mentioned that uh, they command a lot of resources, a lot of funding, and it looks as if this is increasing. But I think we also need to regard them seriously as strategic actors that evolve within the broader sector. Right? So I'm going to be walking you through my work on this. I'm going to talk a little bit about missionary organizations in development generally. I'm going to then talk about missionary organizations in Canada kind of more specifically. Um, so I'm going to start with some history, um, generally talk about history in Canada more specifically, and then look at the results of my research and um, my conclusions. So within um, development studies, there has been a rediscovery of the contributions of religion to development. Um, beginning in 1998, the World Faith and Development Dialogue sought to investigate how the integration of faith could lead to better development. Um, the World Bank Report in 2001, uh, which was entitled Voices of the Poor, also argued that religious institutions could act as agents of transformation. Um, but with all of this research, um, most of it has focused on the religious organizations that look like other NGOs. There's been very little attention to the missionary organizations. Um, I, spent a, I spent some time in a collaborative, it was a two or three year project looking at kind of the intersections between religion and humanitarianism. And we had a series of three meetings with practitioners, uh, with other academics studying this stuff. And for three years, we didn't talk to or talk about missionary organizations, right? And this was something that I brought up over and over again. And I said, well, but like, this is a whole part of the sector, right? This is huge, we can't ignore them. No, but they're too, they're, they're not the same thing. They're doing something different, right? Um, so one of the ironies of this turn to religion is that um, it's actually still continued to ignore a really important part of the history of development, right? And if we look back to the comments um, in 1857 of uh, David Livingston, right, um, who said that it's, who pointed to the kind of ties between uh, moral education, religion, and commerce, economic development, we could regard missionary organizations perhaps as the original NGOs. And this is exactly the argument that Erica Bornstein has made in her. Um, She's done some really significant research on world vision um, and child sponsorship programs, but she's characterized these agencies as the precursor to the contemporary development NGO. So if we think about these missionary organizations as the precursor, um, we can kind of follow them through the, the 20th century, and it's really not until the Second World War that um, we have these, you know, the big development organizations um, being founded. So Oxfam, Save the Children, Care, which are um, amongst the kind of top five or six big development organizations are founded kind of around the World War II era. And this is really the, the time where the development sector as we know it now begins to emerge. And it begins to emerge as a secular sector, right? These are organizations that might have religious people starting them, but they're concertedly kind of a secularized discourse of, of humanity, right? 
Um, at the same time, through the 1960s and the 70s, um, this is kind of this period is characterized as a kind of um, there's a, a process of the NGOization of missions, right? So this is, I mean, this is the the, the 60s, right, people are starting to become disenchanted with religion, disenchanted with the churches, but there's still a sense and a desire for people to go out and, and contribute and change the world, right? So you have a lot of religious folks um, who might have previously become missionaries uh, going to volunteer for organizations in, ca in Canada, for instance, like WESC, right? The World University, what is it? Like that one. <laughs> Right? Um, and agencies like uh, the, United, the United Church, right, um, are, take a look at their practices and think, we want to get more involved in this kind of development work, right? We don't want to, we, the, the future is not missions as such. They start using the language of development rather than the, the language of religion. <laughs> So we have this trend where there's religious folks kind of coming into non-religious organizations and religious organizations that are becoming to look more and more like NGOs, right? So NGOs are kind of becoming the new missionaries of development and the old missionaries are looking more like NGOs. There's this kind of interesting role, re role reversal. But even Despite this trend, I think it's inaccurate to conclude that missionary organizations were completely on the decline. Uh, to the contrary, there's actually evidence to believe, and Julie Hearn has argued this, that we are living in, quote, the greatest missionary era. So Hearn reports a five-fold increase in the total number of missionaries from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century. More recently, a 2008 survey conducted for the 2010 to 2012 Missions Handbook uh, revealed that North American missionary agencies reported a 9.7% increase in the number of full-time missionaries between 2005 and 2008, and a total income in 2008 of $5.7 billion for American agencies alone. Since the 2008 survey only accounted for Protestant organizations and also did not account for workers mobilized by megachurches that completely bypassed the traditional sending agencies, I think there's good reason to believe that the actual numbers are even higher. So if anything, missionary organizations have increased their potential to, to impact overseas development initiatives and to set the development agenda. So despite these impressive numbers, and even with this increased scholarly attention to religion and development, uh, missionary organizations still remain largely invisible within the scholarly literature. So there's an, I think there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, one possible explanation is that the kind of secularist assumptions that underlie the development sector has rendered these organizations outside the purview of de proper development activity. So, for instance, um, one scholar, Ger Gerard Clark, um, who's really one of the, the foremost people talking about faith-based organizations and one of the earliest in the, in the early 2000s, um, has provided a typology of faith-based organizations, which identifies five different categories. Um, and within the typology, he distinguishes between faith-based charitable or development organizations and faith-based missionary organizations. Right? Those are the two of his categories. So already presuming that these are different kinds of organizations. So his categorization presumes a fundamental difference between these organizations, but it overlooks the reality that Christian faith-based organizations engage in both kinds of activities, making it pretty difficult to apply this definition in the first place. Another possible reason for the exclusion of missionary organizations from academic research is that they're perceived as either kind of too small or too extreme or too organizationally distinct. Well, I think I've already um, managed to provide some convincing numbers that would indicate that these organizations are not too small, right? They, they command a pretty significant amount of resources. As for the argument of being too extreme, 
I think that this would overlook the vast diversity amongst organizations within the sector. And certainly there would be organizations that might be considered extreme, but there are other organizations that have different approaches to development. So to apply this kind of um, blanket description against the sector would overlook that diversity. Finally, the kind of presumption that these organizations are too organizationally distinct, that they're just, this would be the assumption that they're, they're just a different kind of animal, right? They don't fit into it, so we're not going to even look at it, right? It's just something too different. Um, th this kind of argument would overlook the ways in which these agencies operate as strategic goal-oriented or actors, just like any other kind of um, institutional actor, just like many other NGOs, right? And this has been, I think, one um, kind of accepted finding within the NGO literature, that NGOs working in humanitarianism, working in development, aren't just all about virtue, aren't just all about good values, right? That, that they are strategic and goal-oriented. So why should we regard these organizations as, as fundamentally different? So let's look more closely at the, the sector in Canada. So in many regards, the history of Canadian Christian organizations in Canada uh, follows the, the overall trajectory that I've just kind of described, this overall history, um, with the emergence of this secularized, professionalized development sector in the 60s, um, which was signified in Canada by the founding of CETA in 1968. Uh, many, although certainly not all Canadian Christian development organizations, actually started as traditional missions organizations, and some of them have their beginnings as early as the, as the 19th century, some of the older ones, as, as, um, as missionary organizations. And if we look at, in the case of CETA, in its early days, um, there were close ties between the agency and the Christian missionary agencies who were, whose members were recognized as being the experts when it came to overseas charitable work. When CETA was founded in 1968, um, the first president, who was Maurice Strong, was intent on harnessing the expertise of the Canadian voluntary sector and to that end recruited many new staff from churches and missionary organizations. And so in my interviews with um, old retired kind of staff of CETA who were there through the 70s, right, I've heard comments like, oh yeah, the hallways of CETA were just full of ex-missionaries, right? So there are close but it's pretty hard to track this in any really like serious uh, quantitative way. This is, uh, it's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but um, the kind of the account, the, the history of CETA, which is written by David Morrison, has also indicated that we're, there were close ties in, in CETA's early days between religious individuals, uh, religious organizations, and the organization. And even up until the 90s, the importance of Christian organizations to Canadian development was actually reflected in CEDA's organizational structure. So within, in, in, and there's been multiple revisions of CEDA's institutional structure over the years, but up until the 90s, there was an NGO division. And within that, or it was an NGO program, and within that there was actually like a church division within the NGO program uh, where there was an officer that was responsible for dealing like specifically with the church based in religious organizations, right? And that was into the 90s. Um, but there are, there are dynamics that are, that are unique to the Canadian context, especially if we can compare to the compare this to the American context. Um, and I think before I started looking at this, my assumption was that the American sector was going to be bigger and richer. Um, but the findings are actually quite striking. So according to uh, the 2008 survey that was conducted for the, the Missions Handbook in 2010-2012, um, both the missionary sectors in Canada and America are growing. 
both sectors report an increase in income, but the increase in reported income is, is significantly higher in Canada than it is in the US um, at 139% increase in income as compared with the US in 79. And even if you kind of remove the, um, if you scale this back and remove 2008 with the financial crisis to kind of adjust for the impact of the financial crisis, um, the, the increase is, is still much higher in Canada than it is in the US if you remove that, that confounding factor. Um, the other part of this is that resources are more, more concentrated in Canada than in the US. So the Missions Handbook survey counts a total of 800 NGOs in America as compared with 166 in Canada, uh, with a total in the US, with a total kind of reported income of 5.7, this averages out to 700,000 per NGO. Of course, this is a really crude way of measuring things, right? Um, but this is just to get a sense of potential concentration of resources. Um, with 166 total income of 7.17 million, this averages out to 4.3 million per NGO. Right, so, um, and there was, there was a, in the same special issue uh, in this past summer in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies, there was more in-depth financial um, research looking at the specific numbers. Um, and Ray van der Zeg came to the same conclusions that the Canadian sector is much more concentrated, right? So with more, a greater concentration of resources, uh, this might indicate that Canadian organizations have the, a higher potential to impact the sector, right? Individual organizations. So going back to another unique fe feature of the Canadian sector is the sector's relationship with CETA. So if we look at the American context and you go to the USAID website, there's this whole kind of section of the website that is devoted to looking at USAID's relationship with religious organizations, right? And it's this pretty, like, pretty significant focus, right? There's a lot of resources that go into this. And it's, and it's something that's talked about, right? Uh, clearly, religion plays a much greater role in the public sphere in the US than it does in Canada. Right. So if we look at the Canadian case, um, well, the, the two stories that I told you at the beginning right, give you a sense of the flavor of how, how we in Canada think about this relationship. It's, it's, one, it's, it's quite tentative, right? And there's a lot of worry associated with it. But what's surprising about this, um, first of all, is the, this kind of close history I've already told you about, um, but also a more recent history um, is the fact that in the early 90s, there was actually an extended dialogue between CETA and Christian organizations that resulted in a pretty widely distributed policy paper, um, which provided a framework for CETA's engagement with Canadian faith-based organizations. So this dialogue took place in, in over the space of a couple of years from kind of 93 to 95, around that time. It was initiated by a CETA employee um, named Norman Cook, um, who I managed to track down <laughs> in my research for my previous, uh, my previous work. He no longer works for CETA, and I think he basically travels around Asia as a visiting, pr visiting professor. <laughs> but I managed to track him down, and he told me how this all came about. And basically there was this dialogue um, that was extremely cordial and resulted in this policy paper that was never actually officially adopted as policy. It was more like a, a photocopied piece of, photocopied document that was circulated. Um, but Canadian organizations still hold on to it today, right? You can, they still pull it out of the file and they say, look, this is the framework through which we operate and through which we conduct our relations with CETA. From the CETA end of things, when you talk to CETA people, they say, yeah, I've heard of this thing, but it was never official policy, right? But what this is, what's really interesting about this is that this is a case of quite innovative early engagement long before anybody else was ever thinking about religion and development. Right? The World Bank Dialogues didn't start until 1998. Right? The academic 
kind of research on religion and development didn't really get going until 2001, 2002. This is happening in Canada in 1993 and 1995. So this policy document comes out and then CETA basically drops it. They don't want anything to do with it anymore. There's some changes um, in staff and, and it's basically dropped and, there's, and CETA has not pursued any active engagement, right? Whereas the American side has kind of continued with this in, in very kind of interesting and political ways. So that's kind of some context for the Canadian sector. So since the goal of the paper um, and the goal of this research is to understand how organizations themselves construct the boundaries between missions and development, my research focuses on organizations that have themselves attempted to distinguish between the two, right? And this is a way for me to kind of narrow my work. So, what I did in my research was I tried to identify a set of organizations that fit these common criteria. And the way that I identified them was that they, they had to self-identify as Christian faith-based organizations. And uh, a lot of the times they do this on their websites um, or they're members of certain coalitions um, or they appear in the missions handbook. Um, Second, a significant portion or a majority of their work takes place um, outside of Canada. Um, so there are tons of organizations that work domestically within Canada, and I just made a kind of strategic choice to look at those organizations that work overseas. Um, and then third, they had to make a distinction themselves between missions and development work. Um, and they can do this through a variety of ways. Um, this could include CETA proposals. So when an organization is writing a CETA proposal, um, they have to specify what that money is going towards and that the money, if it's a religious organization, the money isn't going to be going towards teaching or distribution of Bibles, it's going to be going towards um, infrastructure projects or whatever, but it cannot have a faith element, right? And that has to be very clear in the proposal, right? So they make that distinction through the proposal. Another way they can do this is through organizational structure, right? Where they, the organization itself has different branches and they say, oh, this is our missions branch and this is our development branch. And so we distinguish between the two. So um, how I went about kind of identifying these organizations, I compiled a database which ended up um, including about 260 organizations. Um, and I compiled it by looking at a number of either coalitions, um, which included, there's the Canadian Council of Christian Charities, which, um, I mean, has thousands of organizations, which includes some of them working d domestically, some of them internationally, but what they do have is a great website where you can look for organizations by sector of work. Um, so I kind of looked there. The Evangelical Fellowship of Canada has a coalition. The Canadian Food Grains Bank is a coalition um, of about 15 different organizations. The Canadian Christian Relief and Development Association clearly is a, an important coalition to look at. And then this 2004-2006 uh, edition of the Missions Handbook um, has a completely most of it is about the American sector, but then at the end there's a pretty good look at the Canadian sector, so it separates it out um, to identify organizations that they would consider Canadian organizations. So from this, I was able to um, identify the organizations, get a sense of their funding from websites, from the Missions Handbook, uh, identify which kind of sectors they worked in, um, and from that I was able to identify some key organizations to actually go ahead and do more detailed research on. So, um, so far I've identified seven organizations and have conducted interviews with uh, staff, senior staff members from seven of those organizations. But clearly there's a lot more I could do. So what are the findings? Well, one of the most important findings that emerged from this is that there is a really clear lack of agreement 
uh, both amongst organizations as well as within organizations about the distinction between missions and development. And that these categories really can't capture how Christian agencies view their objectives. So even when such a distinction is reflected in an organization structure or in CETA funding proposals, um, there's no clear philosophical distinction. So interviews with staff members demonstrate that all of the organization's activities, be it building a well or running a hospital, are infused with religious significance. Staff members frequently refer to a holistic approach whereby it's impossible to separate the physical from the spiritual, despite the appearance or necessity of doing so on paper. So if we look, there's kind of, oops, what just happened? Two kind of models of doing this. Um, the first example I'll talk about is World Renew. And if you can see the kind of small print up, up here, um, CRW, CRWRC stands for the Canadian Reformed Christian Reformed World Relief Committee, right? So this is, the, this is the relief and development arm of the Christian Reformed Church. And just in the past year, they've gone through a name change and a rebranding exercise and have decided to change their name to World Renew. Um, so when you go to World Renew, um, they have, they have a pretty huge office, I think out in, um, it's about an hour away from here. And you go in and you get the tour and the director points out to me very clearly, you know, it's over here that our, that World Renew is located. These are our World Renew offices. Uh, and then there's a hallway that leads to the other side of the building. The other side of the building is the missions side of the building, right? Same building. Right? It's clearly a part of the same organization. But World Renew um, is kind of is, is their relief and development arm, right? So it's separated, it's organizationally distinct. Um, so World Renew has a history of receiving large amounts of CETA funding, uh, which indicates that, that the organization has successfully responded to CETA's demands to separate missions and development. It leaves all of its traditional missions activities, such as church planting and teaching to its sister organization, which is the Christian Reformed World Missions, um, and this separation has, instru in, has instrumental value, right? Both because World Renew can claim that its personnel are involved in relief and development, and also because it provides a layer of insulation between its overseas development activities and the church denomination. But nevertheless, in conversations with World Renew staff, it's pretty clear that its activities are given meaning within the framework of Christian faith. Right? So there's this kind of wanting to have it both ways, and it's, it's a very strategic choice on their part. So then the other model, I think, would be kind of symbolized by the organization World Relief. So World Relief is an organization that was founded in, I believe, the late 60s, possibly early 70s, at the height of kind of the secularization of the development sector, and it was decidedly... Um, it was a decidedly a development organization. It has never engaged in what um, we would think of as traditional missionary work. So no proselytization. Um, it also currently receives large amounts of CETA funding for its overseas projects. So here there appears to be a pretty clear delineation between missions and development as well, right? We only do development, right? Um, yet in conversations with uh, the CEO, um, he maintains that the organization's philosophy of development is grounded in an understanding of Christian theology that sees the promotion of social justice and human rights as the true mission of the church, right? So what he's arguing for that is that this is like a more authentic interpretation of Christian theology. Right? So we're not doing missions in the sense that people outside would think of miss missions. What we're doing is saying to the church, this is the mission and you guys have left it out. So we're calling the church back to compassion. So in other words, there's actually no distinction between missions and development because development is the mission. 
So the next kind of logical thing is to ask, well, why do organizations make these distinctions in the first place? Now, I've already talked about uh, the pressure that comes from state donors, right? If you want to get CETA funding, you have to make some kind of distinction, right? Um, but the, the pressure doesn't just come from CETA. It also comes from donors within the church communities that these organizations are working with. So many people reported um, kind of a, what they describe as a generational shift, right? That within the church, there's, which is a reflection of kind of society more broadly, right? Um, there's greater interest in development and, po and poverty-related issues, right? And so people be, want to be able to contribute to this kind of work in an organization that reflects their identity, right? Um, they also report a sense of less attachment to specific institutions, right? Because there's more choice about where you can put your money, right? And so if you're not attached to um, a church, right? And many of these organizations aren't denominational organizations, they're like NGOs, so they can't command the same sense of community that a church would, right? There's greater choice. Right? So these organizations, and even the example of World Renew, which is an arm of the church, has started to rebrand itself to look more like an NGO. Right? So there's more choice. So organizations have to be really strategic about how they make themselves appeal, even to their traditional donor base. Right? Because these donors, individuals, are shopping the humanitarian marketplace to find an organization that's going to match what they want to do. Right? So there's more of a pressure to do more tradition, to do more kind of work that looks like development than work that looks like missions. So on the issue of strategic framing, right, um, we see that organizations have the kind of, there's institutional and financial incentives for organizations to frame themselves as certain kinds of actors within this sector. Um, and they do this very consciously, right? So this, this was a, um, a fascinating conversation I had with the director of development in one denominational organization, where he says, well, we wouldn't say that we're a development organization. We would say that we're a Christian faith-based, sorry, let me, let me say it depends on who you're talking to, right? If you're talking to a guy on an airplane and you think, does he know what I mean by missions? Or if you're talking to a pastor in a church in rural Kenya, you would define yourself maybe a little bit differently. It's the same definition, it just depends which angle you're looking at. Right? So we can, and I had countless conversations with people about with that, that kind of reflected a, a sense of reflectivity about who they were and the kinds of donor base that they were dealing with. Uh, other reasons for making this distinction, there's just a, uh, the negative connotations of missionary work, right? Religious organizations are fully aware of this. Right? And within the churches, there have been big conversations about theological shifts and what is the meaning of missions, right? Huge theological debates. And these theological, philosophical debates have inf influenced practice, right? And then finally, I would say that this is part of a process that we see in the, in the development sector more broadly, right? But is also experienced by these religious organizations, which is an increased demand for accountability and professionalization, right? Um, so if you want to appear accountable, if you want to appear transparent, and you, you ha I mean, you have to do this in order to get your CETA funding. First of all, you have to have pretty good records. Um, but this is also really good for your donors because it's what your donors are expecting too, right? Um, and it's a whole lot easier to quantify kind of development work over missions work, right? Um, it's a lot easier to count wells or goats than it is to count souls, right? And, and this is actually um, a fascinating kind of quote from Africa Inland Mission, which is a fascinating organization because it is one of the old organizations in Canada founded in the late 19th century, right? Um, being around for over 100 years as a missions organization. This is a, would be regarded um, you know, as one of those ex 
extreme, small, organizationally distinct organizations. Yet the Director of Relief and Development um, has a Master's of De Development, I think it's from the University of Ottawa. He's a super young guy, um, really like up to date with, I mean, he sounded like a development guy from any other NGO, right? So there's these kinds of instant, these kind of pressures for accountability and professionalization that um, some of the other older organizations have a really hard time dealing with, right? So when you talk to um, members of these organizations that are more senior, um, they really struggle with this, right? Because they feel like they're giving up. Um, their virtue, they feel like they're becoming too secular if they're kind of succumbing to these demands, right? Which leads me to talk about some of the, the challenges for this sector. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's, there is a potential here to alienate donors, right? Um, and this, this could relate to the generational shift, right? So I had one kind of head of development tell me that he still receives checks, um, as he put it, from the, the, the little old woman at the church who sends her $20 check and specifies that she wants it to go towards um, saving souls, right? And he takes it and he says, well, I mean, everything that we're doing is is this work anyways, so, you know, but better not to say too much, right? And if you say too much, you would risk um, alienating a huge part of your donor base, right? So it's a really kind of tricky tightrope to walk here. So there's the danger of appearing too secular, as well as the danger of appearing too religious, right? Because if you're kind of too religious, then you don't have the opportunity to broaden your donor base. Right? So World Relief, which is the branch of the Christian Reformed Church, is looking more and more like a world vision, right? which is a really successful NGO because it appeals to such a huge donor base. Right? But then you also face the appearance of inconsistency between your motives and your method, right? um, which can lead to some kind of schizophrenic identity. Like, what do you do with this? How do you maintain consistency without narrowing your donor pool. And so you see there's all these tr strategic trade-offs. And the, the point I want to make is that these organizations all realize and recognize this, these strategic trade-offs and deal with them in a whole variety of ways, right? But it's these organizations that are making the distinction between missions and development, I think, that are most interesting because they're quite aware of that. So just some final conclusions, what to take away from this research. Well, I think one of the big takeaways is that um, contrary to these kind of quantitative studies that kind of talk about missionary organizations or religious organizations increasing funding, they don't kind of zoom in closer to look at, well, what kinds of religious organizations? What is the diversity within this sector? How do different organizations look at this differently? Well, there's a whole lot of different methods and strategies. And this, what comes out of this is that also religious identity is quite fluid and very subject to strategic negotiation. I think what's interesting also about this case is that we can see reflections in here of the broader discussions that take place in Canada about the relationship between religion and politics. Um, and the boundaries between them, right? And we can see that these organizations, missionaries, are active participants in setting these boundaries. It's pretty hard to just, um, from this, we can't just place them and assume that they're on one side or another, right? Um, so the argument here is that um, academics and development studies um, people who do research on this um, need to look at missionary organizations um, and regard them as important players in the sector. And if you ignore this, you're ignoring an important part of the sector that is setting development agendas. And then final, um, my final kind of conclusion and, and takeaway is that rather than regarding the kind of rise or the, the influence of missionary organizations as kind of, as O'Day said, this is a, a confessionalization of, of development or this is a return to the missionary era. I think that this is more an example of successful adaptation, right? 
So I'll finish there and I'll be happy to take your questions. Yeah, I mean, that seems like the next logical step, right? Um, I mean, there is already that research out there, or there's starting to be that. Uh, I mentioned Erica Bornstein, for instance, who has done studies looking at, um, like, what does World Vision do on the ground? Um, how effective is that compared with other things? Um, and so I think there are those studies out there, um, but there are fewer studies that have looked at the organizations, the kind of headquarters at home, and the, the kind of decision makers in, at home. So, I mean, that could be a direction of research that I would take, but I've chosen to look at the kind of, this is, I feel like this is a prior step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't speak to effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah, Sally. Um, I know CEDA has changed its funding <laughs> formula. This is probably after sort of the end of your research, but. I mean, typically NGOs, they would finish two or three years or five years sometimes, and then if they report it appropriately, they, they get another five years or whatever of funding. But that doesn't happen any longer. There's competition between mm -hmm. NGOs. And I just wonder how um, these sort of missionary religious NGOs are going to fare versus more secular ones. And this, will there be a division? How, I mean, do, do we know how this is playing out? Yeah, I did these. I did the interviews for this kind of as this was happening and just after. Um, and what's happening is that CETA is putting out tenders for projects, and then NGOs have to bid on them, as opposed to um, organizations submitting proposals for projects. And what seems to be happening is that some. I mean, the organizations that have long histories of CETA funding seem to still be getting it. Um, World Relief hasn't had any problems. They were really successful in the, la in the last round. Um, but World Relief has also is the one that has this kind of interesting inst organizational structure and has a lot of practice at making the distinction, right? So there's, there's a long history there. Um, but I don't think, I don't think there's any indication that things will will change, right? The real choice for NGOs is if they decide to go for CETA funding, um, <laughs> they need to really think about what, what choices they're going to make. Like, how far do they want to go down that road? And for a lot of people, it's regarded as a, as a compromise to have to um, have CETA looking at what they're doing, right? So I think that's the big choice. And the, the, the bidding thing, it, it hasn't appeared to have too much effect, but it could be too early to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know at least one, um, well, it started as a faith-based NGO in Canada, but they, they sort of moved away from that, and they, they recognized that that's how we started, and that's cool, but we're not so much about that anymore. Is that, was that a common trend that you found, or did you, did you find that at all in people yeah. religious names, but they're not so much about that. Yeah, yeah, you know, there was this one organization I tried to contact. Was it the, I think it was the Canadian Leprosy Mission? Or the Christian Leprosy, is it Christian? Or no, it was the Canadian Blind Mission. Canadian Blind Mission. And I sent, I sent this whole, you know, thing of emails to all these people. Could I interview you? And I got this response back um, from the, them. And they said, well, we don't think we fit into your research because, yeah, even though we're um, Christian, it doesn't really influence what we do, and we're not a missionary organization, so 
like I don't think you should talk to us because we don't we don't fit into what you're looking at and I was even I sent this second this follow-up email saying but no no that's actually even better like I want to know why you think you don't fit into that right um, and the name of the organization is Christian Blind Mission Christian Mission you know there's the two big hits there and they said no we're not we're not Christian we're not missions right um, so there are definitely those organizations that have made that choice to um, evolve and maybe their name hasn't caught up with it um, but there's there's a huge variety so the the development arm of the Canadian Baptist mission is a really interesting case because it's 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 moved into kind of relief and development work and doesn't really have a lot to do with like missions work um, but it's made the decision not to apply for CETA funding Right? Even, though, even though potentially that could broaden it. So to go for CETA funding would undermine, they feel it would undermine their legitimacy for their donor base, which is their church donor base, but they still focus their work on development stuff, right? because development is the mission. So there's a pretty big variety. And then there's the organizations which I haven't even begun, begun to speak with that are not interested in CETA funding whatsoever. They, they don't even want to use the language of development. They want to stick with the missionary thing because, because that's what they do. They have this history of it. But the danger there is that they, they become increasingly more irrelevant within the sector. Right? The organizations that reinvent themselves and, and are able to walk that line have the potential to be way more successful. I saw another question. Yeah. Um, did you ever like look into the role that these big like mega churches might have yeah. in doing the development work abroad? And it's not like a, like an NGO, but they still do very similar work. Yeah. The, my short answer is no, but I would love to. Yeah. Maybe that's my next step. Um, so you look mostly at Christian based organizations. Um, have you ever looked beyond that into other? Yeah. Yeah, um, in the previous paper I did on looking at kind of C from the CETA side of things, um, I did try to look quite broadly at the faith-based sector. And well, in, in the dialogue that took place in 1994-95, um, um, my interviewees report that all organizations were invited but because of the history of religious organizations in Canada, right, the other organizations are quite outnumbered, right? So the Christian organizations have the contacts, they have the networks, they have the loudest voice. Um, so I, there was some discussion, I believe, about dealing with that, but because of the, the weight of it was with Christian organizations back in 95, that policy document that was released was entitled Christian NGOs and CETA even though the Aga Khan organization is a, a pretty major um, recipient of CETA aid, right? So um, in that research, I also tried contacting other organizations that hadn't received CETA aid, and it's really difficult to find out if they don't receive aid because they're not applying, or if they don't receive aid because they apply and they don't get it. Right? Because you, if you have an unsuccessful funding application, that's not going to show up on your website. Right? Um, but I did speak with people at Islamic Relief. Um, and this was, this was probably about three years ago that I spoke with them. And they said that like, they don't even want to go there. There's such a, there was such an atmosphere of suspicion about um, Islamic organizations. And that kind of stems back from a... Of a from an incident that took place in the 1990s, an organization called Human Concern International. Um, and there was, Human Concern is based in Canada, but it was doing work in Afghanistan or Pakistan, and it had subcontracted out to somebody who was found to have some dubious ties, and this guy later we found out was the, f was the father of Omar Khadr, right? Um, 
but CETA had been giving funding to Human Concern International, and then there had been these ties between Mr. Cotter and Human Concern, and so it was this big thing in the 90s, right? And then you can imagine after 9-11, with the atmosphere of suspicion around Islamic organizations more generally, Islamic organizations, like, didn't even try. Islamic Relief is a pretty major mainstream Islamic organization. It was founded in Britain in the early 1980s. Um, it walks and talks like an Oxfam, but also has kind of Muslim-specific programming. Um, but it's very much a mainstream NGO and has impeccable accounting, impeccable transparency because it's had to be better than anybody else. And they haven't really, they, at that time, they just said, we, like, we're not even going to touch that. But in the, in the most recent round of CETA funding, I did go through the, the lists, and they, they did receive their first kind of batch of funding from CETA. So that might have broken, but very few, right? I also tried to conduct um, interviews with, there's some pretty big Islamic organizations based in Toronto, and they're NGOs, but they... I mean, their networks are just completely different. They operate through, their networks are communities and mosques, like communities around mosques, but they raise like hundreds and thousands of dollars. And I contact, I sent emails to them like multiple times, they didn't get back to me. And I just took that as an indication of the sense of hostility that they're feeling and the scrutiny. And they, they just didn't want to talk to anybody because they didn't know like, what, where's this gonna be printed and who, what are they gonna be saying about us, right? So that's this whole other side of the Canadian FBO community that there should be, there needs to be a lot of research on this and very, I mean, there's been a little bit, but not a lot. This is kind of ripe. That was a long answer to a short question. Oh, yeah. From the thing, um, these kind of press based and, uh, uh, I mean, organization will um, remain so in terms of position, or you think they will be further NGOIs, um, say, in the next one or two decades to come? Yeah, I think this, that the successful ones will have to become more like NGOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's the trend. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when will this research be published by? <laughs> as soon as possible, I hope. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm hoping to submit it to a journal this week. I've, I'm going through a round of revisions. And, uh, but if you're interested in reading the first round um, from, I think it was June 2012, the thing on CETA came out in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. Okay. Yeah. All right. If there's no more questions, thank you so much for coming up.